All right, Galatians chapter 6, we're wrapping up this chapter, uh, this book rather, and um, great, great book, all kinds of doctrine being packed into Galatians. And Galatians is one of those books that's awesome for showing people salvation by grace through faith. This is what the Apostle Paul was dealing with. He was dealing with, by and large, the problem where they thought, where, where people were bringing in this heresy that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And he was dealing with that in just about every single chapter. Last week we covered circumcision and what that's, what that's supposed to mean, what it does mean, and what it means for us today. And this week we're going to just finish up here in Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And I'm going to take a break here. We're going to just, verse number 1 is just a real powerful verse in and of itself. And we're going to look at some supporting scripture about how we ought to be, especially with brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ within the church. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Because in verse number 1 there, Galatians 6, it's talking about if a man be overtaken a fall. What does that mean? It means they are caught up in some sin. They're overtaken in some fault or some error. You look up the word fault in the Bible. It's, I mean, it's pretty much what you would think the word fault is. Like, oh, it's my fault. I did something wrong. And this is about someone who's overtaken in a fault. They have a sin. They have something that has overtaken them. And this happens from time to time. People get over, they, they get caught up in a sin. You know, every once in a while you might sin and just be like, oh man, I shouldn't do that. And you just don't do that anymore, right? I mean, it happens because we sin. But sometimes you sin and you do it again and you do it again. And before you know it, you're, you're, you're being overtaken by this fault or by this sin. And what this is saying is, if someone's overtaken in a fault, hey, you which are spiritual, you which are walking in the spirit, you who are, you know, doing a pretty decent job of living, you know, the spiritual life, a good life, you know, kind of keeping yourself unspotted from the world. Look, and I know nobody's perfect, but let's face it. There are people who do a pretty good job of living a righteous life, okay? I'm not saying they're perfect, but they're not overtaken in various faults and various sins. You know, they're, they're doing a pretty good job. So that's what you're talking about. Use your spiritual, restore such in one. So we want to help them out. We want them to not be overtaken in a fault because why? When someone gets overtaken in a fault, where's their life going to go? Well, they're going to keep on continuing to sin and then probably add sin upon sin because that's just the way things go. When you start backsliding, you get overtaken in one fault, that'll bleed over and spill over into other areas of your life. And now you're already caught up in this sin and it's going to lead to other things. And we want to stop that. And if you notice someone and you have someone in church, hey, we love these people. We love everybody here. They're like family members. If your own brother or your own sister was getting caught up into something, you say, hey, that's not good. That's not right. What are you going to do? You're going to tell them, right? You're going to approach them. You're going to confront them. Why? Because you don't want them to continue down the wrong path. Well, we ought to do that with, with people in church, with people that we love here, right? When you see someone that's overtaken with a fault, we need to restore such a one, but tell us how to do it. In the spirit of meekness, you have to be humble. You can't be arrogant. You can't have this holier than thou attitude and just walk up to them and be like, what, you know, I saw you go to the movies the other day. You know, what, 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 what's up with that? What do you think? You, know, you, you humbly approach them. You, you do it in the spirit of meekness. Why? Because you're not trying to just drive them further away. Now, this is different from just hearing hard preaching on sin from the pulpit, from the pastor who's preaching out of God's word, okay? When you approach someone who's your friend, you don't need to thunder out and, and, and use all of the hard preaching style that maybe you're used to hearing from behind the pulpit. You go to them one-on-one -on -one and try not to necessarily embarrass them or make it sound like you are just condescending to them. Approach them as a friend and just be like, hey, you know, I'm kind of worried about you. I've noticed some things and I don't think it's that good. Now, ultimately, you know, there's, <laughs> there's only so nice of a way that you can say things when people are in error. But just use tact. Be meek. Don't sound like an arrogant jerk 
go up to them and express your concern for them and try to help restore them back to, to getting out from being overtaken of their fault. And then it says also considering thyself, okay? When you have a friend and you're trying to approach them with something, you need to be very careful for yourself. You need to take heed lest you fall because you don't want to get so wrapped up in communicating with them and conversing with them, talking about their issue to where now it's actually doing the reverse effect. Instead of you helping them out, he's kind of convincing you to continue, you know, to get involved in his sin too, right? This is, this is what you have to watch out for. Because as you, if, if you really have a good dialogue with someone and they're going to open up and talk to you, you do have to be aware of that. Because everybody has a justification for their sin. Everybody does. Especially those that are overtaken in a fault. Because they're justifying it in their mind. That's why they're doing it over and over again. Because they found a way to justify it. And if they try using that justification on you, you need to consider yourself and, and remember, hey, I'm trying to help him get out of this. I don't need to become a part of this and me slip and fall too. And, and you have to just remember that and keep that in mind. Second Timothy chapter two, we're going to see basically the same teaching here. And look, I know that it's not comfortable to approach people and to confront them especially when it's something that they're, we, we, we naturally might like to just kind of look the other way and just ignore it and hope it goes away. But when you have someone that you care about that's, that's overtaken in a fault, you, want, you ought to want to help that person. And if it makes you uncomfortable, so be it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not going to be any more uncomfortable than approaching some random stranger and tell them they're going to go to hell unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's not always comfortable either. When you have to explain to someone, hey, the Bible says if your faith isn't on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. And there's no, ultimately, no real nice way to say that. You try to use tact. You try to approach them. You don't want to come at them as just like, you're going to hell, turn or burn, and just have this type of an attitude. But you still need to give them the truth. And when someone's overtaken in a fault, we want to help that person. We want to restore such an one and do it in the spirit of meekness. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 24. The Bible says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. These are all attributes that the servant of the Lord has. Not to just get in fights, right? We're not going out to just start fights with people and just strive and, and get into fights that way. He says, Be gentle, apt to teach, have the ability to teach, patient. Because when you're working with someone that's, that's overcoming a fault or maybe overcoming some false doctrine, it's going to require a little bit of patience to get through to them, right? Verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Because ultimately, see, these are, this, is the, this is the characteristic of someone who's overtaken a fault. They're not like sinning against you. They're overtaken in their own sin and ultimately they're opposing themselves, right? It's their problem, but we want to give them instruction. We want to help people out that are opposing themselves in meekness. Again, it's, it's the same. Th this is what the Bible is saying is required for us to help these people out is to have a meek, humble attitude when we approach them. We're not coming down on them like we're their father, we're coming down, we're, we're, we're approaching them like they're our brother. It's a big difference. And, and have meekness and humility when we, when we approach people who are overcome with a fault. Uh, let's continue reading here in uh, verse number 25. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, because that's the goal. We want them to change. We want them to change their mind. We want them to realize, oh, I was wrong, and now I'm going to get right. Verse 26, that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice, I mean, the, the verbiage here is almost identical to Galatians 6.1. It's the same exact teaching. This is also um, taught in Leviticus 19. You could turn there if you'd like. Leviticus 19.
and I'll just quote this for you. I brought this up previously in Galatians. Proverbs 27, 5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. It's better just to be open about it and tell someone they're wrong, because that's what a rebuke is. That's better for the person than just secret love, that you love them, and, but you're not saying anything about it, right? Because yeah. when you love someone, you will tell them they're wrong. You, you will be able to approach them. But you do it meekly and humbly, because you'd be like, I don't want friends that are just always going to tell me I'm wrong. Well, I don't want someone who's always going to tell me I'm wrong either. But I do want someone who will, when I am wrong, be able to, be able to tell me that I'm wrong. I think of someone right now who's a very, very close friend of mine who's been very influential in my life, who at times has been able to say things to me that are not always easily received, but are necessary. And I love him and I appreciate him for that. And I love him even more as a friend because he's been able to say things that, you know what, let's face it, nobody wants to hear it. But it was needful because I was wrong. Those have been things I've been wrong about, and I like to be, have those things brought to my attention. And that's when I know I have a true friend, friend, when someone's not just always going to pat me on the back. Hey, patting people on the back is great. We need exhortation, right? We need people to edify us and help build us up. That is important. Don't get me wrong. But it's also important that you can't just do that all the time. In order to help someone, sometimes you need to tell them that they're wrong. And the reason why I'm sure you guys are in a church like this, the reason why I got into a church like our church is because I want to know when I'm wrong. I don't want to just go through life in some fairy tale land thinking that everything I do is right all the time and allow myself to just get lifted up and proud when I'm really not serving God as good as I think I am, when I'm really not as pure, as holy as I think I am. I want to know when I'm wrong. I want to know what God's word says. I want to know these things. Why? Because I want to do right. I want to do better. And I want to improve. And that's the attitude we all ought to have. And, but from time to time, you know, people slip, they fall, they get overtaken a fault, and they need to be told they're wrong. Leviticus chapter number 19. Oh, let me finish Proverbs 27. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It might hurt a little bit. But it's faithful because they care about you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. There's a lot of people that don't love you, that don't care about you, but they'll tell you all kinds of nice things and butter you up when they don't care about you at all. So don't just think, oh, well, this person's always really nice to me, and this person can be a jerk sometimes because they're telling me things I don't want to hear. Don't gravitate just towards a person who's just always super nice and friendly because if it's a little bit overboard, they might have an ulterior motive. Yeah. Love the guy that, that's telling you, hey, you know, th maybe there's some things that you can fix. Leviticus 19, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. And again, this is something that I think we need to call to remembrance that the Bible says these things because naturally we might feel like you don't want to get involved, you don't want to be pushy, you don't want to do, you know, there's so many things you just feel like you don't want to get involved with and you don't want to do, but that's actually the one thing that might be needful and necessary for people to hear and that's why it's so important to, to, do, to use tact, to use meekness when approaching people so that they don't just think like you're trying to rule over them or lord over them or boss over them. You're just trying to help them. And the Bible's instructing us, yea, even commanding us in Leviticus 19, hey, rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Don't allow him to get caught up in the sin. Love your brother. Now, don't be a tail bearer, right? You don't have to go around and tell everybody else what your friend, what your neighbor, what sin they're overtaken in. Everyone doesn't need to know about it. Maybe you're the only person that knows this. Maybe you're friendly with them and you see something, but not, it's not known all around. Don't go telling everybody about it. Oh, brother so-and-so is doing this and doing that. Nobody else needs to know about that. That serves no purpose at all. That's just going around and, and talking about someone and not for their benefit just to bring them down. Deal with it with them. 
Verse number 18, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So if this happens to you, hey, don't take a grudge against that person. If someone approaches you, try to keep this in mind and say, hey, even if, even if they're wrong, let's just say someone approaches you, they think you're overtaking a fault and you're not. Don't get offended. Don't get offended at that person that's trying to help you. Because maybe what they see is being able to tell you, you could say, it, you know, don't lie to yourself, first of all, and, and just have some excuse or justification for your sins. But if it's, maybe it's false, maybe they, they misinterpreted something, you still ought to love that person. Don't hold a grudge against them and realize, well, at least they're trying to help me. They're not out to harm me. They're not out to, to, to do anything wrong. They actually want me to succeed and do better in my Christian walk. Let's keep reading here in Galatians. Turn back to Galatians chapter 6. We've got a few places we're going to be turning tonight, so always keep a bookmark or your place in Galatians 6 because this is the chapter we're going through verse by verse. Galatians 6, verse number 2, the Bible says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And as we continue on here, we're going to see multiple verses that are talking about, you know, basically how we ought to be interacting with people within the church. One, if you see someone overtaking a fault, hey, we're trying there to help them. And now he's saying, bear you one another's burdens. People go through hard times. We've just gone through a lot of our times with people in our church. We need to be there for each other. We need to be able to bear one another's burdens to help each other out through the difficult times. Bible says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, I think it'd be found, Matthew 7, 12, you don't have to turn there. Jesus said, therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You want to treat people the way you would be treated. You want to help out your brother. Hey, if when you're going through really difficult times and really hard times, isn't it nice to have someone else there to help you out? Well, keep that in mind when everything's going well for you and someone else is going through a really difficult time. Think about, hey, what, what, if I was in that situation, what would I want someone to do? Just give me a hand to help out. We always be thinking about these things, just like we try to do as a church. When someone gets really sick, someone gets hospitalized, or someone has a baby, or someone's out for a long time, what we try to do? Try to make meals for them. Try to do something. Hey, let's, let's help bear their burdens a little bit because now they're burdened down. They've got something going on that's serious. Let's come together and help these people out and make their, their struggle a little bit easier. Bear one another's burdens. Look at verse number three, Galatians 6. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. By bearing one another's burdens, this is going to help keep you humble, by the way, too. Why? Because you'll be thinking about other people. When we esteem other people better than ourselves, this is the mind that Christ had, according to Philippians, um, Philippians chapter 3, and having this attitude that other people are more important than me, I'm going to help them out before I help myself. And if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You know, there's, it's, it's almost comical, people who think really highly of themselves, but they're really not that great at all. Um, one, they deceive themselves. Two, they make a mockery of themselves. So we don't want to let, let ourselves get puffed up in our own minds. And one of the ways to do that is by helping other people out and focusing on other people. Because the way that people get lifted up is by thinking about themselves all the time and how great they are. That's what gets a person caught up in full of themselves. But when you're focused on other people and trying to figure out, hey, who can I help? What can I do? Who else can I, can I take care of before, before I take care of myself? That's going to keep you with the right uh, state of mind, the right attitude. Verse number four here, Galatians 6, the Bible says, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for every man shall bear his own burden. Now, this is the way that God wants us to be. The, the Christian man or the Christian person, the godly Christian, will bear his own burden and bear the burdens of others. That's a lot of work, right? Now, if everyone's bearing their own burdens, you think, well, there's probably not going to be as much of a need to bear one another's burdens, right? Well, that would be great in a perfect world, but not everybody has the mind to work and to do what's right and to, and to really make sure they're taking care of themselves. So, and some people just need more help than others also. I mean, just for, for whatever reasons. 
And, but, but to be a godly Christian, you're going to bear your burdens. We see that in verse number five. Every man shall bear his own burden. And in verse number two, bear you one another's burdens. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be strong. How are you going to bear your own burdens and bear other people's burdens? You've got to be strong. You've got to be strengthened. You've got to be relying on God. You've got to be relying on Christ and, and full of wisdom and knowledge and walking in the Spirit yourself because you want to minimize your own burdens. The more sin you're getting caught, wrapped up in, the more burdens you're going to have to have to deal with. Jesus was a great example of this. Obviously, Jesus was without sin, so he didn't have some sin burden. But the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus suffered a lot of persecution. He had a lot of people that hated him. There was a lot of time, I mean, and not only that, he was always focused on other people. He spent his nights up in prayer and his days going around preaching the gospel, healing people, helping other people out, feeding people, you know, whatever, do, doing all of this work. Was Jesus ever demonstrated to be some needy person in the scripture? No. Of course not. Was he always begging people and, do, you know, and just trying to mooch off people and leech off? Of course not. Of course not. Right. And you're not, if that's the type of person you are, you're not right with God. You know, the people that, that are always, you know, whether, you know, whether you're leeching off the government or leeching off other people and just, you're always just, you never have anything of your own because you're lazy and you're not getting off your rear end and you're not working and you're just letting everyone else do all the work for you and always burdening other people. Bear your own burdens first and bear other people's burdens, but don't be a burden on other people. Now, we're not going to begrudge people. We ought to be, you know, trying to help people out and show them error. But you know what? There's some people that you have to learn to just cut off because you're not helping them. While we do need to bear one another's burdens, we have to also consider the cause. The Bible says to consider the cause of the poor. And we need to consider the cause with some people. There are people that I love in the Lord. There's people that, that are brothers or sisters in Christ. There are people that... that they're going to heaven. But with some people, the only way you can help them is by withholding. And I'm talking about people who are well-equipped to do their own work. Now, there are people that exist, of course, that need help. The Bible talks about widows, right? Widows whose you know, their husbands have died. They can't work. They need to be supported. So the church is going to support widows like that when they're, when they're found faithful. And you can read 1 Timothy chapter 5. It goes through all the qualifications, things that you look for in a widow for the church to be responsible for and to care for. And there are people who are injured or maybe they're incapable of working, you know, for whatever reason. Okay, we're going to help those people because they are in need. But the full, abled, the, the young men that you see that, that are sitting on the side of the road with a sign that says anything helps, right? And there's nothing wrong with them. They're completely able. You see them walking around. You might see them pull out a cell phone. You might see them walk over the gas station and get a, get a pack of smokes or get a, get a 40 ounce or whatever. They're just lazy bums. And they don't, they, that's not bearing their burden. We're not, I'm not going to bear their burden when they're just, just in a bunch of sin. I'm going to help someone maybe get out of sin, but I'm not going to just throw money at it thinking that that's going to solve their problems because it's not. You're not helping them any when you enable them to just continue down that same path. And sometimes there's, there's, there's Christian people that, that it's the same way. And we need to be able to, um, to decide, discern that for ourselves. Jesus Christ always provided for himself. Providing for yourself and uh, bearing one of those burdens is, is taught quite a bit in, Thess in the books of Thessalonians. Turn if you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In both epistles to the Thessalonians, this, is, this concept is brought up of being able to bear your own burdens and bearing the burdens of others. And we'll see a good example of the way the Apostle Paul did this. Because this isn't just talking about giving people a free lunch. We'll see what's taught. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 7. The Bible says, For yourselves know 
how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. For naught means for nothing. We didn't just go and eat other people's bread without paying for it, for nothing, or for not, not working for it. He says, but wrought, that means they worked, wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. This is the way that a godly Christian person is going to live their lives. They're going in to do a work, to do a work for God. And he says, you know what? I worked day and night. And you know what the problem with most people? They, they have this, this mentality where they think that everything ought to just be given to them. And I can't work more than four. I mean, 40 hours a week. Are you kidding me? You want me to work more than that? 40 hours a week, that's only eight hours a day. That's, that's daytime. They're working day and night. Why? Because they want to be an example. They don't want to be chargeable anyway. Say, no, we're going to pay our own way. We're going to come in here. We're going to preach the gospel to you. We're going to instruct you. We're going to impart our wisdom unto you. We're going to give you what you need. And we're going to work and provide for ourselves and take nothing from you. Now, according to scripture, it would have been totally acceptable for what the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, what they were doing because they were evangelizing. And, and the Bible says, you know, if you preach the gospel, it's okay for you to live of the gospel and for other people to take care of them. But he says, no. Why? Because he's proving a point. Because he wants to make sure that they know how to work hard. That they, you know, there's nothing wrong with, because look, were they working hard already in the Lord? Of course they were. You bet they were. So it would have been right to receive some type of recompense for the work that they're doing because they're already working hard. He says, you know what? We're going to work even harder because we want you to know that you can do this. And anybody ought to know you can do this. And this is the type of example that I try to lead because look, I've got a family. I've got a full-time job where I work generally over 40 hours a week and I pastor the church full-time. And you know what? I have time to go out and win souls to Christ. I have hours on Sunday to go out and do it, and I have an hour on Wednesday to go out and do it, let alone any other time during the week. I have time to read the Bible. I have time to read the entire New Testament in the month of January. You know what, though? It's not because I'm sleeping for 12 hours a day. <laughs> I'm working day and night. And I'm not saying this to, to make you go, you know, oh, wow, Pastor Burson, she's so great. No. I'm just a regular guy. I'm just a, you know, I never in dreamed of doing anything like this before, but it's totally possible for anybody to do this. You know, people might have this attitude of, oh yeah, of course Pastor Burns is going soul winning because he's a pastor. Well, yeah, I better go soul winning because I'm the pastor, but I have all of the other burdens that you have, yet I make time for it. Why? Because it's important. And this is the example that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach them here. Say, look, you need to labor night and day. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Of course it's a lot of work. But if you're not working, you're not going to get anything done. I need to get things done to support my family, and I need to get things done to build up my retirement in heaven and to fulfill what God has for me to do, the work that he has for me to do. Let's keep reading here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 8. Neither did we eat any, bread for, any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Well, it's not very loving. You better believe it's loving because he's teaching them how to work. He doesn't want them to just be dependent all their lives. People grow up receiving welfare and WIG and all these other government programs and they have no motivation to go out and work for themselves. And he's saying, you know what? If you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. Something's going to give. Yeah. And when you have that type of, a, of a attitude, something will give. You're going to get off your lazy rear end because the hunger in your belly is going to be a little bit too strong. You say, oh, fine, I guess I'll go out and work. And you know what? Sometimes that's what people need. It's necessary. That truly helps them. Now, you might make them upset. You might make them angry. They might not want to be your friend, but that's how you help somebody. 
instead of just giving them everything that they want, instead of just giving them a bunch of money, give them a bunch of food, oh, we've got all this food. You know what, some people, their problem isn't that, you know, and I tell people this all the time. Well, not all the time because I don't really answer the phone that much anymore, but what, whenever I do answer the church phone sometimes, because I, typically I just never answer it and I just wait for people to leave a voicemail. And the reason why is because a lot of people, we have a pretty big Yellow Pages ad, even though we're not that big of a church. And people go down the list of churches and just call and ask for money. Just call every church and say, oh, I, I can't make my rent. Oh, I got this problem. Oh, I got this. oh, I'm living with my boyfriend and, you know, I'm on my way to go get some cigarettes, but my child doesn't have any birthday presents. And it's just so sad. Can you help me just so I could get birthday presents for my children? You want to tell them your problem isn't that you need money. That's not your problem. No amount of money is going to fix your problem. Because the, the first thing I asked is, well, where did you go to church last week? Where did you go to church on Sunday? I have yet to hear a good answer on that one. They don't want to seek God. They just want money. Well, money's not your problem. Get right with God. Jesus Christ said, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You have a problem with money? Seek God first. Get, get right with God first, and he'll take care of you. David said, you know, I've, yet, I, I've been young and now I'm old and I have yet to see a righteous man beg, bed, beg for bread. And I don't and quote that perfectly, but basically he's saying, you know, if you're right with God, you will never have to beg for food because God will provide for you. Because if you're working for him, he'll make sure your needs are met. He's not going to make sure you've got the, the plasma TV and the boat and the rental house and the, you know, the vacation house and whatever, all this other stuff. But he'll make sure your needs are met. He'll take care of you. Verse number 11 here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Bear your own burden. Work quietly. Don't cause a bunch of problems and eat your own bread. And you know what? Once you get that down, then you could start helping other people out and bear one another's burdens. You get yourself taken care of and you can bear other people's burdens and you'll be doing good. Sec uh, First Thessalonians, flip backwards to First Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're going to see basically the same concepts being taught here about people working hard, working for, bearing your own burden, but then also bearing uh, one another's burdens. Look at verse number one. And in both of these examples, the examples of doing right is from the Apostle Paul. Apparently, the people in the church of Thessalonica had a problem in this area because he brought it up in both of his epistles, and neither one are really that long. Look at chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He's saying, even though we've already had problems, we're going places, we go to Philippi and we're being persecuted, we're preaching the gospel and we're coming to you and people are still fighting with us, there's a lot of contention, we're still coming to you and breaching the gospel even though there's all these difficulties, even though it's not easy, even though we're facing resistance, we're still doing this. Verse number three, for our exhortation was not of deceit nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. They're not, they're not trying to trick them when they came to exhort them. They're not, they're not deceiving them. Verse 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. They were not trying to be a burden unto you. We're not trying to receive glory. We're not in it for any of that. We're trying to help you. We're preaching the gospel. Look at verse number seven. But we were gentle among you. And here's the meekness that they showed instructing others. 
We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. That's pretty strong language. He's saying, we cared about you so much that not only are we going to give you the gospel, but we're willing to impart our own souls unto you. We're pouring ourselves out for you. This is the love that they had where they're bearing one another's burdens. They're going to be going and bearing other people's burdens. They're bearing their own because they're not chargeable to them because they're working hard day and night. But then they're pouring themselves out to them by not only preaching the gospel, but doing whatever it is they can to help these people. Truly help these people. Verse number eight. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to part unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Verse number nine. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. This is the type of attitude that Jesus had, working hard, bearing his own burdens, and the burdens of others. This is what the Apostle Paul had. This is what we see demonstrated time and time and again in Scripture. And um, through all, the thing about Jesus Christ, through all of his own burdens, right? And I covered this on Sunday in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, you know, where you see, the Bible says, consider Jesus and, and the contradiction of sinners against himself and him despising the shame and everything that he had to go through because he loved us. He says, you have not um, resisted unto blood, right? He says, you, you, you have not, oh man, I'm not quoting it right at all. But um, basically, we haven't gone through as much as Jesus has gone through. Right. And we need to make sure that we don't get weary and faint in our minds. And um, you think of all the troubles that Jesus had. Not only was he able to bear his own burdens, even when everyone forsook him, he still had to bear his own burdens. He was continually focused on helping others with their burdens. People who were lame, people who were blind, people who were deaf. He cared about those people. You see how many times he, well, Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus looking on him loved him. Je you know, he cared about people and he didn't say, you know how many problems I have and you want to come to me with your problems? Not once did he say that to anybody. Yeah. Did Jesus have a lot of problems? You bet it. You bet he did. People were going about trying to kill him. He was on the run sometimes. Yet he was still helping people out. He didn't say, oh, I don't have time for you. Right. He made time. And you help people out. And this is the attitude that we need to remember and we need to keep in mind and have to bear one another's burdens. Hey, work hard to bear your own burdens. Try not to be a burden to other people. But at the same time, help other people out. If everybody had this mindset, I mean, we'd be doing pretty good. There's still going to be problems, but you'd be doing pretty good. Galatians, go back to Galatians chapter 6. Verse number 6. The Bible says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is a great passage here. There's a lot to learn. But keep this, in, you know, as we're talking about bearing our own burdens, and when people getting overtaken in a fault, hey, you get overtaken in a fault, don't be deceived and try to trick yourself and think that it's not that bad, oh, my sin's not that bad, because God's not mocked. And whatever you sow, you're going to reap. We need to keep that in mind. And people want to mock easy believism and once saved, always saved. And that, you know, Once you put your faith in the ground, oh, that means you can just go off and sin. You know what? It means I'm not going to go to hell when I die. But I'll tell you what, God is not mocked. And believers, you know, don't get too caught up. You know, you go out soul winning and you tell people, um, you know, all the true stuff that 
Once you're saved, you're saved forever. God's not taking it away from you. Amen. Praise God. Bless God for that. But don't get so warped in your view and understanding because you focus on that all the time that you forget that you will be disciplined, you will be punished, that you don't just get away with all of your sins because this is the objection that so many people have. Oh, that mean you could just do whatever you want and you're just fine. Actually, no, you're not just fine because God is not mocked. God gives you commandments, not suggestions, commandments that we ought to obey and follow. And when we disregard God, when we disregard his word, he's not mocked. You can't mock God because he's going to take it back out on you. Now, because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for your sins, he's not going to cast you to hell if you've accepted Christ as your savior. But he will punish you. He will scourge you. He will discipline you because he's not mocked. And whatever you're sowing, if you're sowing corruption and wickedness, it's going to come back and get you and it's going to come back way bigger than that little seed that you sowed because that's the way sowing and reaping works. You sow these little tiny seeds and you reap much bigger things. But on the flip side, that's actually good news because if you're sowing righteousness and you're sowing good things, you're going to reap great things. Praise God, that's good. So, but, but either way, we have to keep that in mind. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're sowing, just understand it's going to come back to you. Let's keep reading. I don't want to, you could, obviously you could spend like sermons on, on just that point alone. But there's other points I wanted to hit in this chapter. Verse number nine, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You need to make sure that we don't quit. Because the reaping will come. The results, the, the fruit of all of your labors will come back to you. And ultimately, it's not even going to come back to you in this world. When you just continue to do good and walk in the Spirit and do what's right by God, we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that God is faithful and He's just. And since He's given us salvation as a free gift, we're not paying for any of our sins. We're actually working for the Lord and he'll pay us. And that's going to be really exciting when that happens. So as hard as it may feel and as weary as you might feel with doing good and doing hard because it's not easy to do the right thing, don't faint. Don't just give up. Don't quit. Because if you can just endure, he says you will reap and you'll get great rewards and blessings for staying the course. Don't give up. Don't throw it all away. Don't throw away all your hard work. Stay in it. Verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. God wants us to do good to people. He wants us to do good to all men. He says, especially those that are brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those who are of the household of faith. We ought to give a little bit more attention and heed to those that are in church, to those that are our brothers and sisters, and, not, and, and you know, do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. Let's keep reading here, verse number 11. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the, cr the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, I went over a lot of that when we went through circumcision and, and kind of the teachings behind that. Um, I, I want to focus in. We're almost done with the chapter. There's one last point I want to cover. It's found in verse number 15. The Bible says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availed anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That new creature I want to focus on. We'll read out the rest of these verses here. We'll be done with Galatians. The Bible says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, turn, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 7. That's where we're going to spend the rest of the time tonight. I want to flesh out a little bit this concept of a new creature. I tried to do this in previous weeks and just kind of ran out of time, but I'm going to do a little bit better job tonight because I do think this is important. I was just out soul winning last week on Sunday, 
and ran into an Adventist, you know, and they're all screwed. You wanted to talk about the Sabbath, but I got off of that real quick. But one of the ways that you could, that, that's a good way to kind of help to explain to people eternal security is the explanation of a new creature, okay? And we're going to look, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. When you put your faith in Christ, that's when you have the new man or the new creature that is born inside of you. That's what Jesus was talking about. He said to be born again. It's a spiritual birth where you have a new man, a new creature. The Bible says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things. All things have become new. Why? Because there's a whole new creature. It's a new life inside of you. That spirit provides life and all things have become new. And I don't have 1 John chapter 3 here. We're not going to go over that, but read 1 John chapter 3. That was the chapter that I was trying to show to this man. And I tried to say, okay, well, you're a sinner, right? I said, you still sin? Yeah, of course. You know, they don't believe in sinless perfection. But he's trying to say how you could lose your salvation and all this other stuff. And I show him 1 John chapter 3. Well, so what does it mean that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin? Because that's a hard verse for some people to figure out, especially if you're, you know, if you're a newer believer, if you haven't read the Bible that much, or if you don't understand this whole concept of the new creature. It's hard to understand, well, what is this talking about? Of course I sin. I'm born of God, but I still sin. How can this possibly say that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin? Because when you read the rest of that verse, it says, for his seed remaineth in him. That seed comes from the word of God. It comes from God himself. It comes from Jesus Christ. That seed, that uncorrupt, incorruptible seed, that perfect seed that provides that life, that new life of the new creature that is living, residing inside of you, that new creature, when you're born again, you get that one birthday. From that point forward, you don't get unborn. That creature, when, when this flesh dies, when this, this body lays in the grave, that new creature is still there. And that new creature, that spirit is without sin. It does not sin. It cannot sin. That's why it, we saw already in Galatians 5, you know, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because you're walking in the new man, in the new creature. That is what's doing right. That is what's letting you do what's right. That's what it can only do right. The new creature does not sin because it's born of God. That does not ever sin. So that is why while you sin in the flesh, it's not the spirit sinning. The flesh stays, your flesh doesn't go to heaven. Not until your flesh, and your flesh is never going to heaven, when your flesh gets changed, that's a different story because that's a different flesh. It's not the same as the flesh we have right now. Romans chapter 7 gives more uh, insight into this. And the Apostle Paul explains this concept of the new creature. Look at verse number 5 of Romans 7. The Bible says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members, to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He's talking about the newness of the spirit there. It's a new creature. All things are become new. That is how we should serve. That is how we should walk. Verse, does it mean you're always going to do it? No, because he said we should. Not you will or you must it's always going to happen for sure. No, we should. Verse number eight. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. And look, this is a perfect explanation of what happens to babies, what happens to infants, what happens to little children when they die. They don't need to be baptized to wash away sins. Because they don't have sins. Why? Because they're alive without the law. As the Apostle Paul says, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. 
There was a point where all of us were alive because we don't know the law. We don't know right from wrong. We can't even sin because we have no concept or knowledge of it at all. Not even the littlest bit. Not even the natural understanding, like Romans 1 talks about people being without excuse. When you're a little child, you don't have that. You have innocence. You are alive. You haven't died yet. When, the, when, when sin revived, he said, I died. Just like Adam died. When God said, hey, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Talking about the, the, the forbidden fruit. He said, when you eat that, you're going to die. Adam and Eve both ate of that fruit. And they didn't physically die. Why? Because they spiritually died. They were alive before that. They had the law, don't do that. Once they broke the law, they died. They needed to be born again. They needed the new creature. It makes perfect sense. And this is consistent throughout all of Scripture. That this is the way things work. When children die, why? They go to heaven because they don't have sin. Because they are alive without the law. But once they, they are cognizant, once they understand right from wrong, once they sin, once God holds them accountable for their sin at whatever age that may be, whatever their understanding is, that is when they die. That is when they need that new creature. He says in verse number 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Jump down to verse number 14. The Bible reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. And, and try to follow these words. Read, we're going to read them slowly. Because he's saying, the things that I do, what I'm actually doing, I allow not. He's saying, I don't want to do them. These are things, he's basically saying, I do things. He's saying, I'm carnal. I do things that I don't even allow for myself to do, but I still end up doing them. When he sins, right? When all of us sin. There are things, you want to live a righteous life and you don't want to break any of God's commandments ever, right? So you don't allow those things, but sometimes you still do them anyways. And he's going to explain all this. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, which means what he wants to do, that do I not. The things I want to do, I'm not even doing them. But what I hate, that do I, if then I do that which I would not, and that would means he doesn't want to, I consent unto the law that it is good. Say, well, the law is still good. The law is the law. The law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law. If I'm breaking the law, if I want to do what's right, if I want to obey the law, if I want to do everything the way I'm supposed to do, but I end up not doing it, it's not the law's fault. It's not the goodness fault. It's not the righteousness fault. It's my fault. And he's saying here, Look at verse number 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So what is he talking about there? He's talking about the new creature. It's no more like I that do it. The things that I want to do, that's all the new creature. That's the spirit. So I'm walking through the I don't want to do those things, and it's not me. That's not me doing it. It's this sin that's dwelling in me. It's this fleshly body that I have that is causing me to do this. Look at verse number 18. For I know that in me, now he clarifies, that is in my flesh. Because when he's referring to himself, he could refer, be referring to his body, he could be referring to his soul, he could be referring to his spirit because we are, we are made up of three parts. Just like God is made up of three parts. He says, no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. There's nothing good in our flesh. At all. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. He's saying, I still have a will. I have a choice. I have a desire. I want to do things, but how to do those things he's having a problem with because the flesh is holding him back. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. He repeats the same phrase a second time. He says, it's not me. That's not me doing it. It's a sin. You say, oh, that sounds like a good cop-out. Yeah, I always say that. When I get into sin, it's, like, it's not me. It's my flesh. You know, I try to make a little light of it. But honestly, in the sight of God, when, we, when, when, when it comes to going to heaven, our flesh isn't going to heaven. But our spirit is, the new creature is. 
And it's, the new creature doesn't sin ever. That new man never sins. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse number 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Is another reference to that new creature, the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And you could read in many other places. I didn't want to make it exhaustive, but you can go and see how the, the sin wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And, um, so the, the spirit wars against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. And these two are contrary to, the, to one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. And over, all throughout the Bible, you see this battle and this struggle going on because there's a difference between your spirit and your flesh. And the reason why I bring this up is because when you're out trying to explain people eternal life, you're trying to explain once saved, always saved. You're trying to explain that it's forever, it's eternal. Sometimes people don't get your normal illustrations. Maybe someone is a little bit more red in Scripture, like people who are these, these cult members. The guy that I talked to had no answer for 1 John chapter 3. He had no way of explaining that. No way. Because he was thinking that, well, if you're doing good, you're saved. And if you're not doing good, you're not saved. And it's just back and forth, this, this ping pong of, well, now I'm saved, now I'm not saved, now I'm saved, now I'm not saved, because I sinned, so now I'm not saved. And now you know, it's like, what do you even have to do? Right? But if you could just explain, look, when you have the new creature, that spirit's always there. That spirit always wants to do what's right, and that spirit never sins. That new creature, that new man, that is a new life, and that's a life that's forever. It doesn't die. The Bible never talks about the new man dying. It doesn't talk about you being unborn. When you're born again, you're born. When you become a child of God, hey, you're a child. He doesn't disown you. He can't. I can't disown. You know, even if I abandoned my children, they're still my children, no matter what. And there's things that I can do in this life because I'm sinful, because I have the flesh, that God would never do. So the things that you might think of, oh, well, you're a father, and if you could, you can destroy your children, all that stuff. Yeah, if I was wicked, I could do that. But God's not wicked. God loves his children. Now he's going to chasten his children, but he's never going to cast them out. He's going to, the, the, the thing that he's, the good thing that he starts, the Bible says he will perform it unto the day of redemption. When you get saved and you get that new creature, he says, he's going to keep that promise. He will fulfill. He will bring you to, to full redemption ultimately when he redeems your body. So keep that in mind. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extra way to, you know, it's a little bit more in depth. It's going to require more time to, to kind of dig into that a little bit. But Romans chapter 7, 1 John chapter 3, you could even go to Galatians chapter 5 and 6 to kind of explain this concept of the new creature and the new man. Hopefully that will help you with your soul. And as far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, this great book of the Bible, the book of Galatians, dear Lord, there's so much um, just doctrine and, and uh, meat packed into these chapters, Lord. I pray that you would please help us to become better soul winners. God, I pray that you please help us to just become better Christians, that we could bear our own burdens and work as hard as we need to work to provide for ourselves and also to provide for other people, dear Lord, to, to bear one another's burdens, to help people when they're down, to be focused on... on having a, a humble attitude and a mindset to where we could instruct those that oppose themselves and, and help them out, dear Lord. Help our church to be strengthened as a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord, to look out for one another. And uh, we ask for your blessings upon our church and help us to become better soul winners by being more knowledgeable in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.